Let's go back. Welcome back. This is Mark Fishkin again. We have the incredible cast with us of Working Man. We have the director, Robert Jury, Peter Garrity, and we have Billy, Billy Brown, as well as the lovely and talented Talir Shire. Welcome. Happy to have you here with us today. This is such an incredible film. And Robert, I wanted to start with you. Um, it, it's been said, in fact, uh, a number of, of critics have commented how much this film is relevant to what's going on now. And obviously that was not something that you, you were uh, thinking about 10 years ago. None of us were thinking about it. But could you tell us really about what the impetus is uh, for this particular story that, that you spent 10 years of your life doing? And also how, how has it been working during this COVID period and releasing a film at this moment in time? Right, um, well, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, pleasure to be here and with everybody in Mill Valley. Um, yeah, this, this was a story that, that was written you know, kind of on the heels of the Great Recession in 2008. So for it to be um, maybe, as you, as you say, relevant now and uh, a movie that, that you know, we've, we've said before, it feels like we're kind of meeting the moment of the times is, is just kind of uh, one of those remarkable circumstances you, you, we, none of us could have predicted. Um, as far as the, the impetus and, and what, what really um, pushed me to, to explore this story in particular is, is kind of my background. I, I grew up around factory towns in the Midwest uh, along the Mississippi River and hadn't really seen those people portrayed, um, certainly not very authentically in a lot of films or, or within television. So it, it, it just seemed to me, I, I knew these people. I, I, you know, friends, family members who were factory workers, blue collar workers. And um, when I landed on this idea of a, a factory worker that continues to go back to his job, even though there's no job for him to return to, um, it, it seemed at the time that, you know, maybe I'd, this would be a story that would be, have a life of a year or two. That was back in 2010, 2011. And here we are it took 10 years to get made and in, and probably a time that's, I, I think, you know, all this time over the course of the, this decade and the fact that we ended up with Peter and Billy and Talia as a cast, it's, it, it, it's, it's not only a story that's happening at the right moment, it's happening with the right people. So uh, we, we've in a strange way really benefited um, from, from the delays and, and the, what otherwise would have been a theatrical release that would have been limited. People have been able to see and experience our story on demand now mm -hmm. uh, in ways that a movie like ours maybe wouldn't have been seen before. So it's, uh, it's silver linings, I guess. We, we, we've, been, we've been grateful just, just to have the opportunity to be out there and, and, and be seen by the public. Well, this film, resonates so much at this time and, and it stands alone um, as a beautiful piece of work. I know it's been compared to um, work by Mike Lee and Ken Loach. For me, uh, having been a, a longtime lover of Italian neorealism, it reminds me of The Bicycle Thieves and Vittorio Del Sica uh, and somewhat of, uh, of uh, some of our greatest uh, playwrights as, as well. Um, it, it's, a, it's a film that resonates in so many different ways, but I would like to know from our esteemed cast here, what resonated for you, Peter, uh, when you read the script. And what is really interesting for me, for me was I actually, uh, upon the second viewing, looked at it and realized how much silence there was, uh, not only in the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and it reminded me of another film, which is completely different, but uh, the first 20 or 30 minutes of The Black Stallion, how engaged one could be with so little dialogue. Um, but Peter, would you tell us how you came to choose this role? Well, <clears throat> um, 
First of all, I think it's just um, actors who are watching you might re relate to this is that I think the need of an actor is to just keep moving, keep keep moving, keep uh, is to not stop. And I'm of such an age where that's very impactful to me. I need to keep moving. I'm, uh, we're like sharks and we can't, we just can't stop. And there's something unique about <clears throat> all of the elements of Allery's life from uh, personal tragedy to uh, un the marriage becoming unfulfilled. It wasn't always that way, but it has become that way. That the and then finally the loss of the uh, loss of the work, loss of the factory, the loss of a paycheck. Uh, there's this kind of constant sense of threat um, that. Allery is is in, on his mind constantly, and and so that the threat causes a kind of um, sense of urgency that that guides in a way the activity that I have. So the um, the walking that Allery does at the very beginning of the film isn't aimless. It is full of not specific purpose, but the sense of God constantly needing to put the left foot forward and then the right foot and then the left foot and to keep going until something shows up and something will show up. And I, I just, I just feel that. I feel that in my own life. I got to keep moving and something's going to show up. And um, in this film, fortunately, um, Billy shows up and, and Talia uh, um, calls me on my crap and will not accept it any longer. And the, these, these forces start happening to me. Billy, uh, Billy gives me a set of keys um, to a, a car and he gives me a set of keys to a to a to a factory that I thought was forever locked to me. You know, these are it's it's not just symbolism. It's like it just opens the door. The door which was locked gets opened, and um, something's going to happen because of that. And it's interesting to me because I'm a man who I have a lot of friends, but almost all of my friends are far flung because they're all people that I fell in love with uh, uh, doing this film or that film or in 25, 30 years of stage work. And I'm still in connection with them, but they're not around me. They're not in this hotel room where I am now. You know, they're not even in the town that I live in, which is not far away. They're far flung and I feel really close to them. But you watch Allery walk along that street. He does not have friends. He does not have people he's close to. And it, and it, and, and it demands that other forces come into play as Bob has written in the, in the character of Walter, as Bob has written in the character of my wife, Iola, in order to put a fire under, under me and change my trajectory. And I saw Maybe not all of that, but I saw a lot of that when I first read read the piece, and it just speaks to my own life. Yeah, yeah and in a sense, uh, Billy, when you came in to their lives, you saved their lives in a way. And I think Iola recognizes that, uh, though perhaps you, Peter, did not, of course, in the beginning. Could you speak to that, Natalia? First, I have to tell you something. Uh, reading the piece, the reading of the piece was unique um, because there's nothing said. For, <laughs> you have, I kept turning the page and I'm going, oh my God, what is the rhythm of this, this man who is in purgatory? Uh, you know, and obviously the, the two of us as a couple have had a great loss and now there's the loss of the factory. Um, very much the, the, honestly, Billy, I always say Billy's the angel. He's an angelic force. And I found it fascinating 
that Robert wrote the keys, the keys. He gave Billy the keys. And everybody has seen the movie already. I, uh, right? Is, is that right, Mark? Exactly, yes. So, you know, we, we, you know, we have lost a child in our in this particular story, and he died. Uh, it, it, this is the mental health issue. Besides the closing of a factory, the audacity of Mr. Jury now to write this other piece, layering it in, which is the suicide of a child in a car, which obviously Ellery is never will not get back in. So Billy gave it, giving the keys, the keys. Uh, is a moment of, and and Allery takes it, of great spiritual freedom and the possibility of redemption. The keys to the factory is the possibility of, I think, transformation. I mean, that, so it's something strangely hopeful um, and very unique in the braiding of these characters and these themes. So, you know, but that walk, that extraordinary walk of yours, Peter, with this, and I, I don't know if you felt this way, Mark, but he's not an empty man. He's not a bitter man. He's he's still very pure and un, unborn in a way, you know, which I felt made the character very, very, very haunting, Peter, that what you did, very, very exciting. There's a real purity there. So, um, Obviously, I I felt it was totally, totally off the wall, frankly, but it but it worked, and I think that Billy's character truly is surreal and healing and inspired, and uh, my, and becomes the son. We we make another family, if you will. Yeah, it seems as if what through all the wonderful moments of. The of the film where you have a character, uh, Peter's character that is not talking that much, but so complex, ah. and wounded, uh, that Billy, I'm sorry, <laughs> somebody to know, we have dogs, we have people, we have everything going on here. <laughs> uh, so when Billy comes in into the picture, it's, it seems to me that it's like, you couldn't save your son. Allery could not save his son, but he was there for Billy. And you were the wise one through this who was able to understand this as this journey progressed or the transformation progressed. Uh, but for you, Billy, this is a, uh, a huge uh, a transformative role in the sense. And what's brilliant about the script, Robert, is that there are so many things that are going on here, not just about the, 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 the value of work in one's life and obviously the great loss, um, but mental health as, as well. Mm. Um, and again, uh, Iola recognized that immediately from the medicine cabinet and her, her sensitivity. Um, so again, you know, what was it, it attracted you and, and uh, having us move forward into the, to the actual story somewhat, can you comment on, on these factors? Of, yeah, so uh, of thank you Alex for having us, appreciate it. I, uh, right away, it was a layering that Bob had put forth in the conversations he and I had in discussion of uh, my playing Walt Brewer and the, uh, you know, the, the wealth of subtext that he had created. And I, I had, um, I found out that Talia and Peter were, uh, you know, were leading our cast. I knew I had to get a piece of that action, as they say. Um, and with, uh, you know, with Walt Brewer, I've had personal experience with a close friend of mine who suffered um, through the devastation of his marriage and, you know, and the trajectory of his life which by all intents and purposes on an ideal track, you know, great family, great home. The last guy you would think would have um, this type of, of, of mental illness overtake every choice, every decision, every movement he made and ultimately affecting his home life and that of his friends. So in reflection upon reading Bobby's script, those those points were very very clear to me. Subtle, 
in what Bob had written and impactful to Allery and Iola and ultimately to myself as Walter and not as Peter said, you know, we're in that middle ground. Walter's arrived here eight months ago from where and why? What choices did he make to bring him to Orange? You know, when uh, Benny says to me, get out of town, Walter, you've been here eight months. Why are you sticking around? It's the last factory that's open. What are you doing? Why doesn't Walter leave it? He's got no ties. The children he's spoken about at the dinner, do they exist? We don't know, we have yet to find out. But through that discovery and reading it and then through, uh, and then bringing it to life, those things were, you know, they were measurable in my choice to, uh, to attack this role. And it was a lot, a little frightening at first to consider it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Now, what am I gonna do this moment to that moment? What's it gonna be like? Um, but I'm so happy that Bob wrote it and all of us were able to bring together a collective energies and uh, to make this movie. You know, I just have to, can I? Do I sure, yeah, please. Uh, okay. Look at it as a I, I just group conversation. To, you know, when you play, when an actor has to play a character that uh, has a, a disease or is dying or, or this particular kind of, of manic depression, and the you, you have to consider the audience because the audience has to feel safe safe enough to watch this human moment so that the audience is healed. And, and I, I was very moved, Billy, because I always felt safe. You didn't, you didn't uh, do it so that I, I was able to feel safe enough to travel with you to this peak moment, which, which is a scary, scary, is it inspiration? Is it mental illness? You know, but as a, I'm just saying, as the audience watching your work, I felt very safe. And that's not a, an easy thing to, to do as an actor. No, oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I felt safe having with you too. It was great. <laughs> uh, but, well, I didn't necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I say, <laughs> one, one of the things that I really loved uh, were two things I'll mention. One is that Billy brings to it is there's this kind of um, surprise. There's a spontaneity. It happens when uh, in many, many, many places, but it happened, for instance, for Allery, one of the first places it happens for Allery was, is when he says, you drive home and he throws keys up in the air. Now the keys come down like any guy can do uh, right in my hands, and and I, it shocks me into acceptance, it shocks me into action. But for Billy, it was just like here, take you drive go, and it just I love that kind of surprise. And another subtler kind of surprise happens. I think that we're faced with all of this business of the factory closing down. There's a there's an air of uh, lost. There's an air of grief in the household, but this is not an uncreative household. When when Allery walks into his son's room, which has been more or less kept the way it is, you see a camera on the shelf. You see a mandolin on the shelf. You see a guitar leaning up against the wall. You see a little keyboard or something. There's all of this creativity that was allowed to be in this house that imbued the sense of this house when that boy, whatever his problems were, were growing up, was growing up. And um, I just, I just, I just love that. I love that, uh, that Bob wrote into the script. This is not improvisation. He wrote into the script. You sit down on the bed, you go, whatever. He, Allery grabs a guitar and he just holds it and you know, plays a chord or something because that's what he remembers his son as having done. This was not an uncreative house. This is a creative house and we don't really see that totally. I mean, that plays out and comes to fruition in the last four minutes of the movie. Is there a yes. parallel between the creativity of the lost son, the lost child, which he exhibited in your house, in the Parks house, 
and that of uh, my own home with yeah. the tapestry on the wall and the detailed work. Uh, yes, in I your own in, in your own house. In the well, most uh, in the most strange but yet worthy places on the walls, where typically keep your hands off the wall, you're going to leave fingerprints. Let's move beyond the fingerprints and let's actually paint tapestries and scenes with 3D imagery of the lead figurines and the military models mm -hmm. in the full scale of each of those different battles. So those. The two parallels of the parks and Brewer's home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it not is quite to, in, in not amazing. To mention, great job you did at cooking. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But Robert, the attention to detail, and as everybody talks about the layering that happens in this movie, coupled with you know, 30 minutes or more of silence is quite audacious. Uh, your first feature, obviously you've been writing and in the business for a long time, but first produced screenplay and directorial debut uh, to, to take these uh, courageous stances and then having it work so beautifully and, and, and uh, led by this incredible staff and what they've added to it is you have to be very, very happy with how this film came out, I would imagine. Oh, I, I couldn't be more pleased. I, and then, you know, what's interesting is, is we've had these conversations and I've got to know Peter and Billy and Talia more over, you know, even since, since we wrapped the film. Um, I just think it's so interesting. Sometimes you're, you're just, uh, you're blessed by the casting gods maybe in some cases because, uh, I, I think about who these who these characters are, and you know some elements that that Billy and Peter and Talia all possess themselves. I mean, when I think about Billy and and his approach, um, he has incredible precision with with the way that he uh, he approaches, or at least how he approached this role, and that's so much a part of Walter's character naturally, right? And um, Talia has this um, amazing intuition, personally, and, and a great love of music, That's something that she really, it was important to her to have as a part of this story. And we had a lot of conversations about that and how that's a part of their, uh, their son Gabe's life and that creativity that you mentioned. And, and Peter, who's, um, of course, I knew about his career, but I didn't know personally how um, how personally driven he is and how important the work is to him as we mentioned earlier alluded to earlier that connection with people and and needing to be out there right and and uh, after having sp you know spending an entire life working I just think these there's there's interesting parallels not only within these characters and within the story but also these actors that are portraying them and and Sometimes I think it's, I don't know, I, I, at least for me, I feel like we captured lightning in a bottle a little bit, right? When you just, and who knows why certain people are drawn to a story or why or a certain moment in time. And I, I really felt like as we were doing, even as we were in production and, and certainly as I was in the editing room with our editors, um, I, I just felt like it was it was working. It was working because of these performances and because of these people here with us today. And and I'm, I was catching up on some uh, series, and I'm glad you didn't bring uh, Peter any of that uh, kind of sociopathic uh, element from Ray Donovan as <laughs> that uh, criminal mind to this story. But uh, just a testament to uh, your. Uh, you're acting in this. I tried. I, I did try. If, I did. And if I could, if I could mention, you know, that's another that's another element of Peter's personality that um, that he brought to the character is is that something that was so unexpected. At least um, he would so often. I mean, you capture these moments. You see these moments in the story where Allery has a great sense of humor. And he, there's 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 a life there that's underneath um, who who he is. You can tell there's there's 
there's much more there and things that I hadn't even imagined or written about. And I, I just, I recall there, there are many times when we were, we were shooting the movie where I, I would just, ha I would have to bite my hand because Peter was doing things or he was, uh, you know, to keep from laughing and, and busting the take because he would just, he would perform these little idiosyncratic movements or, or gestures that just were so much a part of who this character was. And honestly, uh, reminded me so much of the people that, that this character is based upon and um, just kind of uncanny, really. It, it, uh, it, I do remember one thing, Bobby, that you tried to stop me from climbing that ladder to get up on the top of my machine because I had worn, I had worn the machine silly with trying to clean it, and you know, which is not your, anyway. And so I decided to try to clean the smokestack way the hell up on the top. And I'm climbing up this ladder and all I could see in Bob's face was, oh my God, God. There's, a, there's a lawsuit on the way. <laughs> Please get down, please get down. And I'm just saying, roll camera. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, uh, where we talked about uh, improv impr improvising and, and uh, humor. What about uh, the joke about Jesus Christ and the beard? Was that in the script or did uh, that come natural to you, Peter? It's in the script. In the yeah. Script. Yeah, I, I can. One of, the, one, of the, one of the best lines in it, really. <laughs> it's always it always is the biggest laugh, you know. When we were, you know, when we screened the film, it's it. Uh, and I I have to credit my mother in law for that one. I I had grown out my beard one Christmas and and went to my in laws, and she, I walked in the room and and um, she was very quiet, and uh, finally my wife asked. My mother-in-law, why, why aren't you, what do you think of Bob's beard? And I don't like it. I, I, men with beards have something to hide. And on the way home, I joked with my wife. I said, ah, oh, if I'd only been quicker, I, I could have just told her, you know, well, what about Jesus? She's a very devout Roman Catholic. What about Jesus? And I, finally, there was a place for me to use my comeback to my mother-in-law. Um, okay, working. <laughs> You know, we talked about the layering and all the different themes and how beautifully they worked. I think we would be remiss if uh, I didn't ask some things about your incredible cinematography and music mm -hmm. and, and the very talented supporting uh, cast and give a tip of the hat to them as well. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you, absolutely. Can, yeah, can uh, when, Peter, quickly? when you're walking, you, you also find out a lot about the environment that uh, you you live in there, and which is so integral to the story, and it's captured so beautifully by the cinematographer, uh, right? And, and it moves forward the story in, in a transformative way, uh, as well as the music. Yeah, but very yeah. Un in a very understated way. Right. I mean, I, I remember one scene walking along the sidewalk and having to skirt around a family who was putting stuff in boxes. And it's just a, a, you know, a visual little thing that says this family is out, out of a job. They're packing up, they're moving. Mm. You know, they're, they're moving out of town. That's what it meant to me anyway. Um, it, it was very, it's very, very subtle. Um, so, sometimes it's subtle. Piero Basso has a wonderful, the cinematographer, he just, he's a, first of all, he's a wonderful guy, but he also has a wonderful sense of, of, um, scale and and color and she's just a he's and beautiful. you know what i have to say this I, I, this is going to sound a little strange but uh through the years i noticed this he read the script and he 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 was mm. he was structuring that story you know mm. he was not just trying to do his it was mm. he was also acting in the piece he had a, he had a concept uh i think you felt that way robert why right? he was he was he was he he knew where to where to highlight where to do it. No, absolutely, uh, uh, Piero Basso. I'm glad you brought him up and his and his gorgeous cinematography. Um, we had a really close working relationship, and you're right, Talia. He he. Um, <laughs> I, I can't I can't speak for other cinematographers. I'm a first time director, so uh, but my experience with Piero, he took a lot of burden. Uh, 
um, off my shoulders in that he, he worked so closely with me when we were developing a shot list, right? It also, because you're, you're as, a, as an independent film, you know you have to plan so much ahead of time. And so uh, in addition, you know, prior to the film, we had talked a lot about each and every scene. He knew that story inside and out as well as I did, honestly, by the time we were shooting. And um, it, it, it was a, a daily conversation. And when we wrap at night, he and I were roommates during production and uh, we would go home in the evening and, and we'd go grab a beer and go over what we did that day and talk about the next day so that when we arrived, we were ready to go. At least between the two of us, things are always gonna change, but mm -hmm. um, we kind of had an understanding going into it. And David Gonzalez did the, the, oh, the music you composer. mentioned. It's a beautiful score. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, I think just marries so well with, with the story. So just great complimentary pieces all the way around it, that as I say, just in this case, for me, I. I I couldn't be more pleased with, with the outcome. And the wonderful actors, and Peter, you spoke about, mm. you speak a lot because Chicago, right, Peter? It's another yeah. wonderful place Absolutely. where there are just super actors and have been for, for, I don't know, 40, 50 years with Second City and so forth. And you felt that acting excitement there. I did. Yeah. 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 So, so natural, so, so tough, so working class. That's what the hit on Chicago, not the hit, but that's what the rap on Chicago that, always was. You know, if you can get, you want to do tough working class stuff, go to Chicago. And boy, <laughs> we just got these guys that could, and women who could just do it like falling off a log and you just felt, speak about, speaking about feeling comfortable, you know, you just felt like you were living in a life and these guys had been living in that life. So you felt, uh, supported in the very best way you felt cradled by their knowledge of this these kinds of people and 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 such a broad range of kinds of people i mean just wonderful stuff just wonderful stuff and tiny little details bobby i just i thank you very much for allowing me to sit on my lunch hour and share my sausage sandwich. He says sausage sandwich. I say brown swagger. It's brown swagger. And then I <laughs> break down at some point and I cut my little sugar donut in half and put it in a napkin and shoot it across the table too. And and you know that I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to share my damn uh, sugar donut with this cat. <laughs> You know. And I love those moments. Those are amazing from those really subtle moments to uh, uh, Billy, the, the, the way your mental health is personified and its physicality, moving back and forth from your one leg to the next and just totally manic. It, it, it's, it, it's brilliant and a, just a, a pleasure to watch. And from Talia and Peter, from by the end of the movie, when you're dancing, I'm looking at you and going, my God, you guys have grown younger by the end of the movie. It, it's yeah. miraculous. It's a testament to the script and the direction and all of you. And we are just so proud that you uh, allowed us to show this film and could join us today. And if there's any way we can be supportive of it in the future, we'll be delighted to do that. Thank so, you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank, you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.